The Second World War was one of the most complex and varied chapters in human history, with layers upon layers to the whole tragic story. We like to think we have the complete picture of the fight between the Allied and Axis powers, but troops, tanks, ships, and aircraft are just part of the tale, for behind every cataclysmic battle, there is a silent, secret, and deadly world of the spies. Being a spy for the Allies in World War II meant there was a one in four chance you would not be coming back, and yet there were those who thrived in this environment and waged a clandestine war with resistance groups fighting to free their homelands and whose contribution to victory was immeasurable. It took a certain kind of person to be a successful spy, but what would it take to be branded the world's most dangerous spy by your enemy? This is the story of one woman who earned that title. This is the story of Virginia Hall. Welcome to Wars of the World. Virginia Hall was born in Maryland, Baltimore, on April 6th, 1906, and from an early age, it was clear that the newest addition to the Hall family was not going to be content with finishing her education and finding a husband to start a family with. Endowed with a unique skill for learning foreign languages, and filled with the spirit of adventure, she made it clear she intended to travel, with her ultimate aim being to one day become a US diplomat, a rather lofty goal for a woman at the time. She attended the women's colleges at Radcliffe in Massachusetts, and then later Barnard in New York State, where she studied French, German, and Italian before attending George Washington University. Here, she added economics to her education. After a brief love affair with a man she seemed set to marry ended following his infidelity, she decided to continue her education in Europe before looking to start her diplomatic career finding a job as a consular service clerk at the US Embassy in Warsaw, Poland in 1931. However, after just a few months, she requested a transfer to work in Izmir, Turkey. Hall relished all that life in exotic Turkey had to offer, but sadly, this would lead to an incident that would change her life forever after. One popular activity her and her friends at the American consulate liked to indulge in was to hunt game birds in the marshy swamps around Izmir. Hall was well acquainted with firearms, but on a hunting excursion in 1933, she absent-mindedly let the barrel of her loaded gun point downwards before it slipped out of her hands. Instinctively reaching out for the falling weapon, her fingers inadvertently squeezed the trigger, and a single shot was fired into her left foot. By the time her friends had managed to get her to a nearby hospital, septicemia had set in, forcing the doctors to amputate the leg in order to prevent the blood poisoning from spreading and killing her. Even then, it wasn't clear if she would pull through, and for several days, she was in and out of consciousness, but eventually recovered, attributing her persistence to a dream of her deceased father telling her that her mother still needed her. Recovering back in the United States, she was eventually fitted with a prosthetic leg on which she walked with a slight limp, but she never let her disability define who she was. She returned to her work as a clerk in Turkey, and then Italy and Estonia, but, dissatisfied with the job, continually applied for more important roles in the diplomatic service. Her efforts were always rebuffed, something she attributed to her artificial leg more than anything else. Frustrated by her lack of progress, while still in Estonia in April of 1939, she resigned from her post, but elected to stay in Eastern Europe for the time being, rather than returning to the United States. That summer was of course a difficult one for the entire continent, if not the world, as Hitler was on the march. Almost two months after the German Wehrmacht overran Poland, Hall made her way west to France with a determination to do something to stop the spread of fascism, finding a place within the French Army Ambulance Unit. In May 1940, she found herself driving an ambulance as close as 20 miles to the front lines, where she witnessed the chaos firsthand her vehicle being attacked from the air several times, while desperate refugees often swamped the ambulance looking for help. 
which often she could not give, having run out of supplies herself. With France ultimately defeated, Hall had no intention of living under a dictatorship. With land and sea routes to Britain or the US blocked, her only option to escape was to head south across the border into Spain, officially a neutral country, but one known to have sympathies with Hitler. Purely by chance, in Spain she met a British intelligence officer named George Bellows, who was so impressed with her that he decided to introduce her to an associate of his named Nicholas Boddington. Boddington worked for a new branch of the British government, known as the Special Operations Executive, or SOE, which had been established by Prime Minister Winston Churchill in 1940. With the badly bruised British forces unable to mount any kind of assault on Europe for the foreseeable future, the SOE would instead work alongside local resistance groups in occupied lands, gathering intelligence on the enemy, coordinating operations between resistance cells, sabotaging German equipment, and of course, conducting assassinations. With her knowledge of European languages, her first-hand experience on the ground in Europe, and her natural drive and determination, she was an ideal candidate, and so she was transported to Britain for her induction and training. Hall was then assigned to the SOE's F section, the F standing for France, and it was not long before she was given her first assignment. Using her nationality as camouflage for her real purpose, she was inserted into Vichy, France on August 23, 1941 posing as a reporter for the New York Post, who would later print stories under her alias to help conceal her true identity. This allowed her to ask questions and openly take notes without drawing too much suspicion, both Vichy France and the United States now being neutral in the ongoing war. Working for the SOE, Hall was based in and around Lyon and helped establish and maintain a network of safe houses for agents to use when hiding from Vichy French authorities and their Gestapo masters. Her network, or circuit as they were known, was given the codename Heckler to identify it in the SOE. She also passed messages between different agents, as well as the many resistance cells within France that were being established. On top of this, she gathered intelligence on government officials who could either be bribed or blackmailed into aiding the cause against Hitler. This sometimes being achieved by paying prostitutes for information that their German or Vichy clients leaked to them during times where their defenses were down. She knew that to remain as low profile as possible would be the key to staying alive, so she began dressing extremely conservatively while becoming creative with her makeup, using it to highlight or conceal parts of her face in an effort to never appear exactly the same as the day before. On more than one occasion, her cautious nature helped keep her safe from discovery. Just two months into her time in Vichy, France, she narrowly escaped capture when she suspected that Vichy authorities had learned of a meeting between SOE agents. The meeting was indeed raided, and several agents were arrested, but she managed to slip away undetected. Evening up the score, Hall would be instrumental in orchestrating a jailbreak of 12 of the captured agents from Mauzak Prison. Hiding tools in food parcels taken in by a prisoner's wife on July 15, 1942, the agents made their escape, with Hall establishing an escape route for them, including transport and safe houses. It was an extraordinary success for the SOE, but brought down the fury of the Gestapo, who sent in more than 500 agents to track her and the escapees down. Despite Virginia's best efforts, ultimately she began to draw suspicion, and in November of 1942, a French priest and German informant singled her out as a possible SOE agent. The time had come for her to make an escape, and so, once again, she raced for the Spanish border, trekking some 50 miles over the Pyrenees as winter began to bite before reaching the safety of Spain. For illegally entering the country, she was arrested by Spanish authorities and briefly detained before the US consulate negotiated for her release, after which she returned to Britain. By the time of her return, the overall situation with the war had changed dramatically. Her native United States was now fully embroiled in the fight against Hitler, and with the SOE considering her to be compromised, she decided to join the American equivalent organization, dubbed the Office of Strategic Services, or OSS. 
In the SOE's defense, they had every reason to be cautious about sending her back into the field. The Germans were still furiously searching for her, and had come to recognize that she walked with a slight limp as a result of her prosthetic leg, leading them to refer to her as the Limping Lady of Lyon. One man in particular had taken an interest in capturing her, a vicious Nazi by the name of Klaus Barbie, the man history would remember as the Butcher of Lyon. Barbie had become almost obsessed with capturing her, and branded her as the most dangerous enemy spy, given her success in France, although he labored under the false belief that she was Canadian rather than American. With Nazi society emphasizing a woman's place as a homemaker, the use of female agents was viewed as obscene by the Gestapo, and captured female agents were subjected to arguably even more heinous forms of torture than their male comrades. Typical torture in the line of torn out fingernails was to be expected, but there was also the sexual assault aspect, one of Barbie's preferred methods of degradation. But while this was enough to keep her sidelined within the SOE, the OSS felt that her skills and experience were desperately needed, and so, now under American command, she prepared to return to France. However, her cautious nature, which had kept her alive thus far, guided her to taking additional and more extreme precautions. Recognizing that the Gestapo had a fairly accurate impression of her appearance, she decided to pose as a much older woman, this affording her the ability to change her walk to more of a shuffle as befitting the impression of an elderly lady, while at the same time concealing her limp. She also learned from a makeup artist how to emphasize her natural facial lines in order to make them appear as wrinkles, further aging her appearance. But perhaps most drastically, she paid a London dentist to file down her pristine white teeth to appear cracked and damaged, as befitting a French peasant woman. It was March 1944 when she was due to return to France. Preparations for the D-Day landings were now well underway, and her primary focus was to make contact with the French resistance and help lay the groundwork for the invasion. Operating under the codename Diane, she landed in Brittany on the night of March 21st, 1944, being inserted by gunboat rather than parachuted in, as was the typical method because of her leg. Landing with her that night was 62-year-old Henry Lassut, who was to lead their OSS network, but Hall was not impressed with him and would soon part ways, believing that his talkative nature would get him into trouble. In the run-up to D-Day, much of her time was spent arming and training the French resistance and coordinating their efforts with Allied command. Based in the countryside south of Paris, she posed as a French milkmaid for much of the daylight hours, while training new resistance members during the night. Despite her time in France, her accent still left much to be desired, and so she enlisted the support of a local woman to do as much of the talking in public as they could get away with. Working with the Allied headquarters in Britain, she created several resistance cells and arranged airdrops of weapons for them to use, essentially building an army of insurgents several hundred strong. Her resistance cells made sure that German activities behind the front lines in and around Normandy after June 6th were never secure and constantly disrupted. She also attempted another jailbreak of prisoners, but unfortunately this failed. As the Allies moved out of Normandy, Hall was then transferred further south. But one problem persisted wherever she went, and that was the lack of respect from some of the French resistance leaders who didn't recognize her authority, either because she was a woman or because she had been given the measly rank of second lieutenant in the OSS, and she was issuing orders to French resistance leaders who viewed themselves as colonels or even generals. Nevertheless, she persisted with them, and eventually earned their somewhat begrudging respect. By September 1944, much of Western and Northern France had been liberated, including Paris, and the remnants of the Vichy government had fled into exile in Germany. The French resistance was thus increasingly being incorporated into the regular Allied armies, making the covert assistance from the SOE and OSS redundant. As such, Hall, who by now had ditched her disguise as an old woman, was given arguably her most dangerous assignment yet, and that was to enter Austria and work with anti-Nazi groups in the country which had been absorbed into Germany during the Anschluss in 1938. Working with a man named Paul Goliath, Operating in Austria was rather different to France. 
Paul and Goliath were afforded much greater freedom in selecting their operations, although they were instructed to make targeting Germany's new jet fighter bases a priority. They were also told that in selecting recruits for their Austrian resistance cells, that quality was preferable to quantity, as smaller units were less likely to be discovered by the Germans. Armed Austrian resistance was nowhere near the scale of other nations brought under the swastika, but had the added danger of operating in a population whose loyalties were often unknown. Austrian resistance groups, like those Hall and Goliath coordinated with, sent back vital intelligence on German operations and potential targets for air raids, as well as conducting ambushes and sabotage, all the while producing some of the first reliable information on the scale of the Holocaust up to this point. On May 7, 1945, Germany unconditionally surrendered, bringing an end to the war in Europe. Returning to France, Hall immediately found herself writing frantic reports of who had helped her and her resistance, not just so they could be recognized for their contribution, but to stop any violence or murder towards suspected collaborators who were in fact working with her. The priest who had revealed her to the Nazis in 1942 was one of those executed after the war. Having become close to Paul Goliath during their time working together, the two lived with each other off and on for many years in the US after the war, until finally marrying in 1957. Virginia Goliath died on July 8, 1982, her story largely overlooked for many years due to her silence regarding what she did. However, in recent years, as her story has become uncovered, we can look back on this remarkable woman's story and honor her instrumental role in defeating fascist tyranny. Virginia Hall, the world's most dangerous spy.